one of the last session of Easter. Um, first of all, congratulations on surviving Easter. Um, and we're trying to save the last, the best for last. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Yiping Kang. I'm a postdoc at University of Michigan. Um, we, even though it's the last session, we have some awesome, interesting paper. I talked to all the authors before the session, so I'm super excited for what we're going to be able to talk about today. Um, so we did start a little bit late, but given it's the last session, you know, I'm going to try to make it a little bit more fun. Um, you know, I'm going to give the presenters some more time to present if they want to, and, uh, you know, we'll try to do questions and stuff. All right, so our first presenter is Zhang Xiaowen Rong, who is a research scientist from the Parallel Computing Labs at Intel Labs. He recently received his PhD from UIUC, advised by uh, Professor Joseph Torellis. He sees his research focus on accelerates DNA workloads on CPUs by exploiting sparsity. And today he's going to introduce us their work uh, looking at optimizing genes on CPUs through uh, software hardware code design. So take it away. Oh. Um. Hi, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, I am Zhang Xiaowen from Intel and the University of Illinois. Uh, today I'm presenting uh, Graphite, uh, optimizing graph neural networks on CPUs through cooperative software hardware uh, techniques. So GNN is a type of DNN that specializes in processing graphs, which is a hard task for other types of DNN. Uh, it has wide application domains, including recommender systems, uh, social networks, knowledge graphs, physics, uh, life science, and many more. A genome often contains two alternating phases. The first phase is called aggregation, uh, where each vertex gathers and reduces the features from its neighbors and or edges. The subsequent phase is called update, uh, where each vertex computes its output features from the aggregation result uh, with a deep learning operator such as MLP. The two phases have contrasting characteristics. Um, aggregation is like a, a traditional graph analytics. Um, it operates on sparse connections uh, and it is irregular and memory intensive. And the aggregation time of a vertex is correlated with the degree of the vertex. Update is like other DNNs. It contains dense uh, computation, which is regular and compute intensive. Uh, the update time of each vertex is similar. Uh, the aggregation phase dominates the execution time uh, and often contributes to uh, over 80% of the total execution time. Uh, in multi-layer GNNs, uh, the hidden features can contain a significant amount of zeros. And the use of the ReLU activation function in some models can specify the uh, features uh, by 20 to 80%. Uh, feature dropout during training can also set a uh, predefined portion of the features to zero. The example here shows the output sparsity of the first and second layer of a three-layer graph stage uh, training. It shows that uh, ReLU and dropout collectively making the uh, hidden features over 80% sparse. Now, operating on zeros uh, is often ineffectual. Uh, however, the feature sparsity typically changes dynamically and has no discernible structure, making it hard to leverage. One notable difference between genes and traditional uh, graph analytics is that uh, while traditional graph analytics usually involve scalar features, uh, genes often operate on hundreds to uh, thousands of features per uh, vertex. And lastly, the input graphs are reused during genen training. So CPUs are a viable platform for genes for two reasons. First, uh, real-world graphs can have millions uh, to billions of vertices and edges. The terabyte-level memory capacity of CPUs can enable full-batch operations on those graphs. Um, second, CPU servers are widely deployed and have high ab uh, availability. Using data center spare CPU cycles for DNN tasks uh, is a common industrial practice. We found that uh, GNN workloads on CPUs are often memory bandwidth bound. Uh, for example, in a three-layer graph stage training on CPUs, only 10% of the pipeline slots do useful work. 62% of the pipeline slots are wasted waiting for memory. We propose Graphbyte, uh, which is a collection of cooperative software and hardware techniques that optimize GNNs on CPUs. Uh, Graphbyte uh, tackles the memory bandwidth problem. Its software techniques uh, include 
a layer fusion scheme to overlap the memory uh, operations in the aggregation and the compute in the update. Uh, a feature compression scheme that reduces memory traffic by eliminating zeros and uh, an input preprocessing algorithm that increases the locality of the features. On average, uh, the combination of the techniques speeds up the inference by 1.8x and the training by 1.9x. Uh, Graphite also enhances a CPU's DMA engine to offload aggregation. On average, the combined software and hardware efforts uh, speeds up the inference by 1.8x and training by 2.4x. So uh, now let me introduce our software uh, techniques. We first designed a basic implementation uh, as the basis for our techniques. The implementation first aggregates all vertices and then updates them. Uh, this is a common practice in other GNN implementations. For aggregation, we use a JIT assembler to generate the kernel uh, that is tailored to each GNN layer specification. We use output parallelization to avoid synchronization and cache line invalidation. Um, the kernel is hand vectorized uh, with Intel AVX512 instructions. Uh, we also insert software prefetch to uh, maximize in flight memory requests. Because the aggregation time varies for each vertex, to balance the load among processors, we divide the vertices into small batches and dynamically schedule their aggregation to processors. Uh, for update, we do not develop customized kernels, we instead implement it with a uh, high performance gem library. The first technique on top of the basic implementation is layer fusion. Uh, layer fusion is a known technique in the DNN uh, community. Its original purpose is mainly to reduce memory footprint and traffic, uh, such as fusing a convolutional layer and its subsequent ReLU in a convolutional neural, uh, neural network. However, although these benefits also apply here, uh, the goal of our uh, layer fusion, or more precisely, uh, phase fusion, is to overlap memory bound operations and compute bound operations. Uh, with Fusion, instead of aggregating all vertices and then updating them, we update each vertex batch after aggregating it. The compute memory overlap happens at two levels. Uh, first, within a processor, during the aggregation of a batch, we prefetch in software the features need needed by the aggregation of the next batch. Uh, in this way, the ongoing prefetch overlap with the uh, compute intensive update in the former batch. Um, second, uh, so recall that the aggregation time of vertex batch varies. Um, as a result, the executions on different processors will stagger. Uh, overlap of the aggregation and update naturally happens without using synchronizations to force the execution to go out of phase. Uh, because memory bandwidth is, is shared among processors, the interprocessor overlap can alleviate the bandwidth pressure. The second technique uh, reduces memory traffic by avoiding loading and storing zeros. We accomplish uh, fast online compression and decompression with AVX512 vector instructions. Uh, compressing a vector has two uh, steps. The first step is to generate a bit mask that, uh, that marks the locations of the non-zero elements in, a, uh, in the vector. It is done with a vector comparison instruction. Uh, the second step collapses the bubbles in the vector uh, according to the bit mask. And after the compression, we only store the non-zero elements and the bit mask. Uh, decompression is even simpler. The, the original vector can be restored from the non-zero elements and the bit mask with a single uh, vector decompression instruction. Because the features of each vertex can span multiple cache lines, the, pen, uh, the temporal locality of the features uh, is important. Uh, therefore, the third technique uh, aims to increase the temporal reuse of vertex features in the aggregation. The technique pre-processes the input graph and computes a new processing order of vertices. The new order groups the vertices that shares a, uh, a common neighbor so that the features of this common neighbor are reused temporarily. We design a greedy algorithm to prioritize the reuse of the features of high, uh, high degree vertices. And here is the outcome of, a, uh, of the algorithm on a toy example. Uh, the original processing order here is from V0 uh, to V5 in sequence. In the new processing order, the first group consists of V0, V2, V3, and V4. They all fetch, uh, they all fetch V1's features uh, during the aggregation. 
and we expect we uh, to remain in the cache during the application of these four vertices. The second group has V1 and V5. They both fetch v 4 features during the aggregation. Uh, and note that V2 connects to both V1 and V4 uh, because V1 has a, a higher degree than V4. Uh, the greedy algorithm assigns V2 to the group of V1. And in the end, the new processing order contains temporal reuse of both V1 and V4 uh, features. The algorithm is very simple and has linear complexity. Uh, so it, uh, it scales well to uh, huge graphs. However, it may still be an unaffordable overhead for inference where the input graph may be used only once. Uh, fortunately, input graphs are reused many times in training. So the cost of the pre-processing can be amortized. Uh, therefore, we only apply this technique uh, in training. So that concludes the uh, software techniques. And, law, and now let me introduce our uh, software hardware co-design technique. The aggregation is basically a gather and reduce. The processor brings the features to the L1 data cache and subsequently to the core to only perform simple reductions. And the gathered feature have a low reuse even after uh, the, the locality optimization. And therefore, bringing features to L1 or even to L2 is wasteful. We notice that modern DMA engines often provide scatter gather uh, functionality. So we propose to enhance such DMA engines to uh, offload the aggregation. Uh, in our design, each processor is equipped with a DMA engine that connects to the on-chip network. We place the DMA engine near the L2 cache for two reasons. Uh, first, a DMA, a DMA engine can work with virtual addresses by uh, using the L2 TLB for address translation. Uh, second, the, the, uh, the DMA engine can write the aggregation results to L2 so that the core can fetch them for the update easily. We allow the DMA operations to work in user space for uh, faster accesses. For aggregation, the enhanced DMA engine reuses many function units in the original engine. Uh, it adds uh, a narrow vector unit to perform the reductions. We adopt a descriptor-based programming model uh, we design a descriptor that can encode an entire um, aggregation and can be easily built from an adjacency matrix encoded in the CSR format. Because uh, compression hardware is expensive, we do not add it to the DMA engine. So the hardware assisted aggregation is incompatible with feature compression. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it is orthogonal to the other um, software techniques. And here is an example DMA aggregation. Uh, three processors are attached to the on-chip network and each one has a, a DMA engine and a L3 slice with directory. Um, so first a processor initiates a DMA aggregation by issuing uh, a descriptor. The DMA engine then gathers the info features using the existing gather functionality. Uh, the gathered features are stored in the engine's internal buffer so that they do not pollute L2. Uh, the size of the internal buffer is limited, uh, so the engine removes a block of features from the buffer immediately after they are reduced, and the engine can then use the freed up space to fetch another block of features. After all features are reduced, uh, the DMA engine writes the results to L2 so that the core can easily access them for the update. The engine prefetches these output lines to L2 in exclusive mode in advance to minimize the write latency. The DMA engine performs the aggregation asynchronously. Uh, in the meantime, the core can perform the update. Uh, we pipeline the two phases such that while the core is updating a vertex batch, the DMA engine aggregates the next vertex batch. This creates a perfect overlap. And we evaluate graphite on two popular uh, genomes, GCN and GraphSage. The data sets include graphs with millions of vertices and up to billions of edges. The baseline of the evaluation uses the state of the art, this GNN for aggregation and the Intel MKL for update. Uh, this GNN has been incorporated into the popular GNN framework DGL. We evaluate our software techniques uh, on a 28 core server CPU natively, and we evaluate our co design techniques uh, in the sniper simulator that simulates the 28 core CPU. 
for the software techniques, uh, the result shows that uh, the basic implementation already outperforms the baseline. For both inference and training, layer fusion and feature compression both provide additional speed up uh, and they're synergetic. Uh, note that we evaluate, uh, evaluate feature compression at 50% sparsity, uh, which is conservative. Um, real world uh, sparsity is uh, usually much higher. For training only, we also show the speed up with the additional locality optimization. And in the end, the combination of the techniques speed up the inference by 1.8x and training by 1.9x. Uh, for the co-design techniques, the DMA-assisted layer fusion outperforms the software-only layer fusion significantly. And the locality optimization also further uh, speeds up the, uh, the training. Uh, finally, the co-design techniques speeds up um, the inference by 1.x and uh, training by 2.4x on average. So in conclusion, uh, GNNs on CPUs are memory bandwidth bound. We propose a graphite that tackles the memory issue. Graphite includes three software techniques and one co-design technique, and they are synergetic. Our evaluation shows that graphite uh, is effective. And please refer to the paper for more details of the work. Thank you very much and welcome for any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're gonna open up for a couple of questions. Hi, great talk, thank you. I'm Bahar from Google and University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, so uh, if I understood correctly, I thought that the uh, locality problem that you mentioned earlier uh, was spatial locality, but I realized that your solution uh, actually improves the temporal locality. So can you elaborate on that, that, on what are the challenges about locality and what which type and your solution? Thank you. Okay, so um, the, the algorithm seems like uh, relocating the, the vertices, it seems like uh, to tackle some spatial locality problem, but in fact, the uh, relocation of these, uh, th these vertices uh, is to change the processing order of them. Um, the processing order is crucial for temporal locality. So the, the main, a uh, reason um, for, for grouping these vertices together is to process them closing time so um, they can uh, reduce uh, some given uh, shared uh, neighbors features. Uh, so the, the, the reason here um, that temporal locality is, uh, is more important for GNN is mainly that uh, GNN has uh, very long lens feature vectors for, uh, uh, for, for vertices. Um, so the, the feature ve uh, vector um, from different vertices, the, the, uh, the, sp the spatial uh, locality of these different uh, vectors, it doesn't really matter that much, but the temporal locality of these uh, multi cache line vectors will be uh, much more important. So that, yeah, thanks. Uh, we have time for one or two more questions. Hello. Hello, Johan from uh, University of Michigan. Nice work. So uh, I have a question about the sparsity of the data set you use. So I noticed that you used a, a bit mask uh, compression, but like you need one bit uh, mask for all the data, even for the zeros. But if you use uh, things like CSR, you only need the indices, indices for the non-zeros. So I, I, I know that uh, if you use indices, it's probably 32 bits. Uh, for each one, but uh, if the if the density of the data sets is less than say uh, about three percent, then the CSR, CSR format is probably uh, smaller than a bit mask you use. Um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Nice question. Thank, thank you. Um, so yeah, you actually, I, I think you, you you answered the question yourself. You mentioned that the the CSR is beneficial when the the uh, density is lower than a couple of percent, but uh, but for uh, for the for the feature sparsity, the the ReLU and uh, dropout can uh, usually only uh, get up to uh, eighty or ninety percent sparsity. Uh, it's it's much lower than the threshold. Yeah. 
All right, let's thank Zhang Xiaowen one more time. All right, our second presenter is uh, Yunji Li. He is currently pursuing a PhD in the School of Electrical Engineering at Korea Advanced Institution of Science and Technology, advised by Professor Min Su Yu. Uh, his research interests are hardware, software, code design, and server architecture for machine learning. Today, he's gonna talk to us about their work called SmartSage, uh, training large scale graph neural network using in storage processing architecture. Yunji, take it away. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yun Li from KAIS. Today, I'm going to talk about smart stage training large scale graph neural networks using in storage processing architectures. This work is done with my colleagues, Jinna Chong and Professor Min Su Ryu. First, let me introduce the research scope of this work. Graph neural networks, or GNNs, have recently merged as a powerful tool in the areas of e-commerce and advertisement. As GNS extract high quality features from graphs with billions of users and item feature embeddings, they are being widely adopted as the state-of-the-art recommendation system. With this popularity, we are witnessing a large number of GNN algorithms and ML frameworks being developed. However, while current ML frameworks help improve the programmability of GNS, they employ in-memory training model, which limits all of graph data to be stored inside main memory. The key challenge of GNN training is that graph data structures are memory hungry. As real-world graph nodes and edges typically amount to hundreds of billion scale, such large-scale GNN training is bottlenecked by memory capacity. To address this challenge of, of memory wall, ML practitioners are forced to, to tune their GNN algorithms to fit within CPU memory, even if they want to explore large-scale graph learning. So you may be wondering what in-memory training model is. Let's look into how it works on current ML frameworks. Current ML frameworks adopt hybrid CPU-GPU approach for GNN training. GNN training utilizes the key data structures of graph datasets, which are composed of neighbor at list and feature table. Neighbor at list encapsulates the structure of graph, and feature table includes each node's unique property as a feature vector. As both of data structures get larger with hundreds of billions scale, the capacity optimized CPU memory is utilized to store them and CPU goes through data preparation, which is the most important part in GNN training. The key idea of data preparation is generating small size of soft graph to feed into GPU memory. So let me explain the key steps of data preparation. First, CPU samples a fixed number of neighbor nodes around the user A up to K hops which is two halves in this example. And then it gathers the corresponding feature vectors from the entire feature table in continuous buffer. Through these two steps, a soft graph is generated and notice that the number of nodes for training can be largely reduced by neighbor sampling compared to the full graph. 
The software data structures are copied to GPU memory over PCIe. And finally, GNN training is conducted over the softgraph on GPU. GNN training on GPU consists of aggregation and DNN computation. GNN first aggregates the neighbor node features of the target node, and the aggregated feature is projected into new dimension through DNN computation. Finally, we now have a new encoded feature which is used for prediction or classification. So now that we covered the basics of in-memory training model, let's come back to the key challenge of GNN training. Graphs are memory hungry, but in-memory training model forces ML practitioners to tune their algorithms to fit within CPU memory. As an alternative, the challenge of memory capacity limited GNN training can be solved by NVMe SSDs, but we know that there is a large performance gap between DRAM and NVMe SSD. In this work, we focus on exploring the feasibility of non-volatile memory solution for large-scale GNN training with the questions how much the performance gap is and how we could bridge it. To answer these questions, we first build our baseline SSD-based system for large scale GNN training. <coughs> so let's look into our baseline system architecture for large scale GNN training. The large scale graph data can be stored in SSD and accessed by memory mapped file. So during training, CPU memory is utilized as a fast cache using OS page cache. For this reason, it is possible for our baseline system to reduce the access latency for high locality accesses. This slide shows the profiling result of our training system. We explored two systems in memory and SS based system with five different public graph data sets. Here, the left Y axis shows the latency breakdown of each step in the end-to-end -end training process, and the right y-axis shows the, shows the normalized latency to the in-memory training system. Against our expectations, we observed that neighbor sampling becomes a major performance bottleneck due to its memory access pattern, which results in a significant slowdown to the baseline system. For the details of neighbor sampling, it has an irregular data flow with little compute intensity because neighbor sampling just randomly, randomly selects multiple K-hop neighbors and simply aggregates them without heavy computations. Therefore, due to this locality limited nature of neighbor sampling, the baseline suffers from the high latency overheads of, of handling page cache misses. For these reasons, we explored a large-scale GNN training system with an emphasis on reducing and optimizing latency. Now, let's come back to our original question. How could we bridge the performance gap between DRAM and NVMe SSD? To answer this question, we developed SmartSage, an in-storage processing-based GNN training system that offloads the data-intensive stage to the ISP unit. This slide illustrates where the ISP unit can come in handy. Let's assume that the target nodes to, to extract features are node 1 and node 10. Here, the neighbor at list stores all the neighbor nodes IDs around the given graph node in a sequential manner for the entire graph data set. To sample the neighbor node, CPU initiate multiple block redial requests to fetch all the, all the neighbor node IDs of the target nodes into main memory. And then CPU randomly samples the neighbor nodes from the fetched node ID chunks. However, notice that proportional to the number of target nodes, CPU ends up generating a large number of IO fetch requests. This results in a significant overfetching of useless data from SSD to CPU, leading to severe underutilization of IO bandwidth. Therefore, 
we offload neighbor sampling operator to the ISP unit. Now, ISP unit performs fine-grained gather operations from the neighbor at the list directly and transfers the dense node ID list to CPU, amplifying the effective throughput. To implement in storage neighbor sampling, we first explored two types of computational storage devices. One is an FPGA-based approach to utilize FPGA integrated near the SSD with peer-to-peer -peer communication. And an alternative is to utilize embedded cores within SSD known as a firmware-based approach. Neighbor sampling, neighbor sampling offloaded to the FPGA-based approach is conducted over peer-to-peer -peer communication. First, data is transferred from SSD to FPGA, and FPGA conducts neighbor sampling. And then the result is transferred to host CPU memory. We observed that the benefits of ISP acceleration using FPGA are overkilled by peer-to-peer -peer communication overhead. Therefore, we have decided to choose the firmware-based approach for our ISP hardware prototype. For our evaluation, we also implemented, implemented in storage neighbor sampling on the FPGA-based approach, but due to the timing constraints, please leave refer to our paper for the detailed explanation. In addition to our ISP hardware system, we also implemented software system based on the hardware. As discussed in the characterization, we found out that there are still performance improvement opportunities in the baseline MF-based system. The baseline experiences slow down due to the locality limited nature of neighbor sampling. Given this point, we design our software runtime and host driver stack. Our software prototype utilizes a direct IO feature to bypass the opportunistic OS page cache and allocates user space buffer to manually orchestrate the data movements between SSD and CPU. Additionally, notice that a single software generation on direct IO based system spawns off a large number of IO fetch requests depending on the number of target nodes. To address this problem, our smart stage driver encapsulates the entire IO fetch request of neighbor sampling under a single MVME transaction. Through this optimization, Smart Sage could largely reduce the number of IO commands. Now, let me move on our evaluation methodology. Our ISP hardware prototype was implemented using Cosmos Plus OpenSSD platform, and we used PyTorch geometry framework for our software system. Also, for our evaluation, we chose five public graph datasets. Using our hardware software prototype, we explored four system design points. The first one is the baseline memory map based SSD. And the second one is software only smart stage, which uses a direct IO feature without ISP. The third one is our proposed architecture with all the proposed optimizations, smart stage hardware software. And last, we compare our smart stage against an upper bound oracular in memory training design point. So here are the results. On the y axis, we show latency breakdown of each step in the end to end training process. As shown in this chart, our software only smart stage largely reduces the latency in conducting neighbor sampling by bypassing OS page cache. Using our ISP acceleration, our proposal achieves further performance improvement compared to the software only smart stage. However, our proposal still has a non trivial performance gap compared to the, to the in memory train system. Through the detailed analysis, we tried to figure out what the problem is, and we found out that. 
The reason is OpenSSD's WIMP embedded cores get overwhelmed in delivering sufficient levels of ISP compute power. More concretely, since our OpenSSD based, based neighbor sampling time shares the embedded cores with the SSD's firmware, the interference between them degrades the level of speed achieved with in storage neighbor sampling. To prove the effectiveness of our proposal, we establish a hypothetical design point with higher ISP compute power than OpenSSD, SmartSage, Oracle. Here, we assume that unlike OpenSSD, a near computational storage device contains the dedicated ISP purpose embedded cores like NGD systems Newport. So overall, SmartSage Oracle only incurs a slight slowdown, com slight slowdown compared to the in-memory training system, which shows that a near computational storage device can become a viable option for large-scale GNN training. To conclude, we have proposed SmartSage large-scale GNN training system using in-storage processing architectures. We conduct a detailed characterization on the data intensive stage of large scale GNN training. Also, to bridge the wide performance gap between DRAM and SSD, we co designed the software hardware system of large scale GNN training. And also, our proposed architecture achieves superior performance over the baseline SSD based system. Thank you for listening. Hello, this is Gerasmus from IUC. I really liked your work. I have two questions. The first question is, would any of your optimizations be applicable to GNN models without sampling? For example, the graph convolutional network or the graph attention network in the full graph training case without any sampling or mini batch. This is the first question. And the second question is, what is the reason that we included, for example, the Reddit data set, which uh, as long as the feature dimensions remain like 500, 1000, it fits in the, in the DRAM of a CPU server, for example. So, so your question is graph attention networks works on in our, um, our work is, is it correct so i think could you repeat your question yeah, yes the, let's suppose that the graph convolutional network it's easier case right it does not have any sampling in its vanilla case mm -hmm. right i am wondering if any of your optimizations would be applicable in the graph convolutional network without sampling um our work is based on the software only uh work in the uh, ISP solutions. So I think even if there is no um, sampling in graph, graph neural networks, I think it works on, it works on our uh, work. So our work is based on soft, software only um, approach. All right. The second question was why you, you uh, what is the purpose of using the Reddit data set in your evaluation, which uh, is not a very large data set. It can fit in the DRAM. So your question is um, the data set, the, data, the graph data set we used in uh, our version, it is small, right? No, 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 it's right. I'm just asking uh, what is the Sorry. purpose of using a data set which, uh, as far as I'm concerned, fits in the DRAM, so you don't need to go to SSD. There is no uh, page replacement. So uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> the, uh, yes, 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 thank you. Hello, um, this is Ali Reza from University of Michigan. Thank you very much for your presentation. So if you go back to the evaluation slide, um, 
yeah. So uh, after the black portion, uh, a good portion of the uh, chart is CPU to GPU uh, data transfer, which is actually the um, features, right? Yeah. Um, can't we offload the aggregation of the first layer also to the in you know, a storage processing so that we have less data to transfer? Oh yes, uh, that's a really good question. Um, that is actually our future work. But in this for um in this hour in this hour work, we we only target the neighbor sampling uh, operator, which um, executing on the neighbor at least only. Yeah. All right. Let's thank you, G, one more time. So actually present first and then share because oh, but no. yeah. all right. All right. So the third presenter of our session, Shuang Chen Li, who is a research scientist in Alibaba's DMAO Academy. He has been working on application-driven customized architecture for data centers. Uh, specifically looking at near data processing for recommendation systems and uh, AI accelerator. So today he's going to introduce us to their work uh, looking at hyperscale uh, IPG as a service architecture for uh, distributed GR. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you everyone for staying for the last second of my talk. I will try to make it worse. Uh, once again, my name is Sean Lee from Alibaba Dama Academy. I'm going to talk about the large-scale GNNs on uh, FPGA cloud. As an uh, executive summary, uh, as an executive summary, we'll talk about uh, the background of our large-scale distributed GNNs used in the e-commerce scenario. The graph is pretty large, has to be carried out uh, distributed heterogeneous system. And the bottom now comes to the graph summary stage with a lot of uh, remote memory access. The trend here would be the long latency between the machines and the underutilized bandwidth. So our solution is to uh, provide a customized hardware design uh, to offload those efficient workloads from the CPU and providing high uh, power availability and scalability. We validated the hardware with the IPJ prototype, and based on that, we discussed how to deploy it on the IPJ cloud, providing a high uh, performance product again. And we also did a, a device based exploration to show how future cloud IPJ architecture could be and pros and cons in regard to the uh, GN performance. So I would like to thank the first two reviewers give a very good introduction of GN. So I just need to make a little bit add on, uh, give you an introduction on how GN is used in the e-commerce context. So the graph will be something like this. Uh, the nodes are the customers and the, the, the products. When a customer purchase something or click something, there will be an edge. 
The graph is pretty large, uh, considering there are tens of billions of nodes and different from, as the first speaker mentioned, different from the, the graph uh, analytics. Uh, GN, each node has a very large attribute and also for the edge. So that makes the graph size uh, nearly tens of terabytes per application. And that could be larger since the graph is already pruned and people always want to embed more information in the attribute and the customer and, and the, 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 the product are getting, uh, you know, uh, increasing. So you could expect a larger uh, graph in the future. Uh, people in Alibaba has been working on the GN algorithms for a long time. There are some examples uh, for the application. When you have the graph like this, you can simply do a link prediction, which allocate the, the potential customers for a new product. And also, uh, GN has been proved as a good way to generate the embedded table for either the, the customer or the product uh, to fit in the the technical online recommendation pipeline. Other uses could be, for example, our risk control. You can find the, the fake, uh, fake ID, a fake account, or you can do the spam review detection, uh, detection, et cetera. So the large graph is now streaming access to random assets, <laughs> and it could be dynamic data and it's ever increasing. So this calls for a system with uh, distributed in memory database, and it would like better be in an uh, industrial environment to meet the uh, scalability demand. And also the end-to-end -end application may be more complex than you expected, so GNN can be plugged into a larger variety of different types of applications. So the, the system would better be a heterogeneous system, a uh, homo GPU or homo CPU may not work that well. So we in Alibaba also got a lot of uh, software effort uh, to uh, highly optimize the software for such applications. One of the most popular one is the graph learner or aka Alibaba. It's, it's an open source framework and can be accessible through Alibaba Cloud Service. And after work on the, the Amazon and the software, this work mainly focus on the hardware side, how to improve the, the efficiency for this workload. At the time we decided to work on them, we saw uh, almost all the other work on uh, what we call the single machine DNA. Uh, for that case, uh, it's mainly focus on a standalone accelerator, focus on the problem is a relatively small size of uh, graph that can be fit in the uh, HBM or a single machine. But that kind of uh, uh, work, uh, we found this uh, difficult to solve the large scale GM problem because first the workflow is different. Uh, for a small GM, you can use the full batch training, which was the last question you mentioned. But for large GM, you can barely afford that. You usually use the mini batch training. Uh, for, for different type of workflow, uh, uh, workflow, you can refer to the paper. And then the bottleneck is quite different. For the single machine GN, uh, people usually focus on the local memory access efficiency and the uh, acceleration on uh, sparse, uh, sparse metrics multiplication. But on the large size GN, uh, the bottleneck will be the summary stage and on the remote you know, inter machine memory access. And we are very happy to see that. Uh, papers in this area also work on the same problem, the large size here has to be. Uh, after a careful characterization, we show that the, the summary stage in the whole pipeline uh, is dominated in terms of the time it takes, the access, and the results it takes, the y access, the memory growth rate, which is not scale. And for the uh, neural network part, it's uh, already been well done in the, uh, in the open shelf. Uh, GPT or separators. So this work mainly focus on how to efficient do the graph sampling on the uh, first part. Oh, I'm sorry. Does it work now? Sorry about that. Oh, uh, and we further break down the the bottleneck into two challenges. One is the long uh, latency uh, challenges uh, when you do memory access across machine. The other one is the uh, underutilized bandwidth. Since uh, in graph, you have a lot of fine granularity memory access that really hurt the, the bandwidth utilization. 
So to solve that, we can uh, customize hardware uh, and to give you a very high level overview in the sense of detail in the paper. So in the hardware, we have all, uh, mostly three parts. One is the risk of file center uh, control center. So everything else is connected to this risk of file with uh, the two structures. And what is exposed to the software is a very clean risk file uh, construction extension interface, providing a good operability. And the access injury part uh, does mostly uh, all the heavy lifting job. It does the graph sampling operations. It's a very um, highly optimized uh, hardware, uh, deeply pipeline, providing massive parallelisms and uh, allowing handles of uh, on the fly memory request, send and receiving out of order. Uh, it basically solves the, the long uh, the long latency problem. And also the memory or fabric block, which uh, so the uh, optimize the communication between cars. Uh, it has some optimization for the uh, various utilization, for example, packing all the small uh, fun brand uh, requests in one big request and do the compression on those address and data. We did the, the hardware design in a kind of a hardware IP stack uh, so that it can be plugged into different uh, scenarios. For example, you can change the local memory to from a, a direct DDR or to a PCIe connected memory, and etc. And all the other blocks are parameterized, and you can reconfigure it according to the uh, you know the, the, the demands. Then we further uh, validate this hardware with the FPGA global concept protocol. In the prototype, we have a four FPGA and four GPU connect together with the PCIe switch. And for each FPGA, they have the private DDR, multi channel DDR on board. And FPGA to FPGA have the dedicated uh, cable to connect to each other. So the, the hardware is then integrated into the uh, Allegra software so that you user can. Uh, use the Alibraph software to run an uh, end to end GNN application on this prototype. We show that uh, in this particular prototype, uh, the, the performances for one FPGA card, uh, it can provide a sampling, graph sampling capability uh, equals to 800 Porsche, uh, Porsche CPUs. And in addition to that, we also validated our EPOS simulator with this uh, uh, measurement result from the prototype. The simulator is later used in the in that space exploration. So after the hardware IP development, uh, validated this with this uh, IPGA and integrated with the uh, soft software, the next thing we were going to do was to kind of deploy such an architecture. We look at different types of uh, directions and then finally we set to go with the uh, cloud FPJ in this case. Uh, for the reason that the cloud FPJ provide a higher return over investment ratio, uh, especially compared to other directions where you have to do a basic deployment. And also it's naturally hyperscale, uh, it can meet the scalability command. And it's flexible just in case the GI always um, has some major change in the future. Uh, we deploy the, the hardware IP on the off-the-shelf uh, cloud FPGA architecture uh, with the following adoptions. For the local memory, we use the host uh, pinned memory and FPGA can access that through PCIe. And for the remote memory, the FPGA will access that through the uh, infinity band or the Ethernet. And for the result, the FPGA has to, again, uh, send that through the, the Ethernet because uh, the GPU instance are now located with the FPGA instance. In addition to the uh, off the shelf uh, cloud FPGA architecture, we also provide a, a comprehensive data space exploration to show different other uh, cloud FPGA system architectures. Uh, to show uh, maybe in the future you can uh, adopt a different architecture and their pros and cons. For example, in the other device, we assume that the cloud provider will have a instance with both FPGA and GPU inside on one machine so that the result from the FPGA can be pushed to this GPU with the PCIe P2P connect, having a, a better, uh, better bandwidth and lower latency. 
uh, we call this type of design the, the high decoupled design in compared to the uh, off the shelf decoupled design. And we have a lot of uh, other uh, type of architectures, which I, I will go through that in the next slides. So let's see the result first for the, for the off the shelf uh, call IPJ deployment. The performance on Pandora can be uh, about 2x compared to the, the Watcher CPU instance. And we, if we do the uh, tiny couple design, it gives you more uh, performance for Dora. And uh, another design we explored is what we call cost optimized, uh, cost optimized architecture. In this one, you don't have a, a dedicated bit on the IPJ uh, on, the, on the server anymore. Instead, we use the IPJ itself to do the uh, network. Uh, in that sense, it may not provide a better performance per dollar for the users, but it saves a lot of cost for the uh, cloud providers because you don't need to buy the net anymore and you save a form factor to pull out other devices. And this will uh, also go along with the target data center design trend considering, say, the AWS has the intro and the uh, Ali other uh, well, also have the X shredded just to do the similar things. And another design uh, may be uh, what we call communication optimized design. In this way, uh, in this, uh, this type of architecture, we don't have, the, have to uh, use Ethernet to do information communication. Instead, we will have a dedicated large bandwidth uh, fabric connected to different IPJs directly. Uh, this will, uh, since this removes the uh, inter-machine communication overhead, that gives you know, a boost on the performance per order compared to the uh, off-the-shelf design, it's almost 1.5 to uh, 2x improvement. However, for deploying such design, uh, it may be difficult because it has an unknown cost on the maintenance because you introduce a uh, bystander fabric into the FPGA and also the risk of reliability. Uh, that said, if you consider maybe in a few years later, uh, when the CXL is mature enough to replace all the fabric in the data center, this type of, of development will, will make more sense. And also, after we uh, use the uh, direct link from FJ to FJ to solve the inter uh, inter communication, the uh, bottleneck will move to the local DDR access, which uh, we uh, off the shelf uh, design into the PCIe link the, uh, link the uh, way. Uh, then you can put the, 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 the DDR on the IPGA. Uh, it's a multi channel DDR. You can have a large uh, local memory bandwidth. And then uh, maybe the, the IPGA to GPU uh, PCIe becomes another bottleneck. To solve that, you can use a direct connection, something like an link to link the PCI, uh, link the uh, GPU and the FPGA. Such design will have the best performance per dollar, it will 3x compared to the off the shelf um, architecture. However, it takes a lot of cost because you have to put the DDR on the uh, FPGA, that's a lot of cost there. Um, however, if you Take a look at this uh, architecture in another angle. Uh, this IPJ card is something like a, a memory extension to the GPU. It, it will be some architecture like the risk hopper design from the NVIDIA. Or if you think everything as the uh, CXL connected uh, machine and uh, the IPJ can be something like a CXL extend memory is a near data processing on board. So in that sense, this type of architecture may be promising in the um, in the long run. And uh, we, uh, at the time we want to deploy this, we look at different uh, different directions, but we didn't have uh, have the chance to go over them deep in uh, into detail one by one. Uh, but we encourage the community to uh, keep looking this uh, interesting area. And we are happy to see, for example, the first uh, speaker talking about the uh, uh, DMA integrated that into the, the, the uh, CPU or the near uh, storage computing. There are all very uh, interesting areas to look for. And uh, what I want to say for the reviewers and uh, a large, very, very wide uh, 
uh, collaborations in the Alabama to uh, help uh, be created this work. Uh, with that, I'm done with my talk. And <laughs> Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. So I have a quick question. So <clears throat> you're focusing on IPGA, right? IPGA as a service. Have you considered um, using ACID for kind of this use case and what are the, the trade-offs? Yeah. Uh, you know, well, we did consider the uh, ACID implementation. Uh, it uh, can give a slightly uh, performance boost uh, compared to the IPGA. And then the bonus will be the, the IO the link the PCRE. So it now uh, be a big improvement and uh, the cost of the return over interest will be very low. So we go with that. Okay, thank you. Well, if there's no more questions, let's thank I'm not sure if you mentioned this. Is there a performance impact in between the NIC on the FPGA versus having separate or dedicated NIC? Oh, I'm sorry, can I go slowly? Uh, is there a performance impact in having the NIC on the FPGA versus having a separate dedicated NIC? Oh, that depends on how you implement the hardware. As we assume, the, uh, the uh, NIC on the FPGA should be as well as the dedicated NIC. So it's just a cost issue then? Yes. Okay. All right, let's thank Chong Chen one more time. Um, I think it's fine to have you start speak. Um, all right. Um, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Yu Feng, who's a fifth year PhD from a uh, student from University of Rochester. He is working on hardware algorithm co design for point cloud and in sensor computer for AR and VR. Uh, today, he's going to talk to us about their work looking at team memory regularities for, for accelerating the point cloud analytics. Yu Feng, take it away. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, let's get started. Uh, deep learning in computer vision has enabled so many applications such as autonomous driving, robotics, etc. In current computer vision system, there are two main modalities that drive such innovation. They are 2D image and point cloud. And the main cooperation in image domain is 2D and 3D convolution. In convolution, a input feature map will convolve with set of weights to get an output feature map. The data flow of convolution operation is very regular and static known. Due to the access regularity, we can continuously stream data to the Anchi buffer and so that we can leverage the DRAM streaming access to reduce the uh, communication cost. In addition, with a careful data layout, we can avoid band conflicts in the f and reduce the access latency. On the other hand, the computation in point cloud DRMs are different. In point cloud DRM, each layer will first perform neighbor search to find nearest neighbors for each query point, and then gather the neighbor features and perform MLP operations in feature computation. Uh, both operations will introduce in regular memory access, and I'm going to talk about them in detail next. First, let me explain the neighbor search. Well, exhaustive neighbor search does compile regular memory access pattern, uh, but k tree search is a far more efficient way to find uh, to find nearest neighbors in a point cloud. Uh, similar to other tree-like structure, k tree is a space partition tree, 
each node will partition the space into two subspaces, and we build k three by iteratively partition the entire space. And in canonical k three search, each query will traverse the k three and find its nearest neighbors. Uh, due to the irregularity of tree traversal, k three is notoriously memory access inefficient due to its uh, irregular memory access and redundant memory access. And in order to mitigate the irregular memory access, prior work has proposed to um, split, uh, split KG tree into a top tree and several sub trees. And in this split tree version of KG tree search, each query will first perform top tree search and be assigned to a particular sub tree. And each sub tree has its own bucket to store the uh, query points. After the top tree search, it, uh, each sub tree will perform. Uh, subtree search for all the query points in its own uh, subtree bucket. Because we perform this uh, case research subtree by subtree, we only need to load one subtree to the SRAM. And the subtree size is much smaller than the uh, SRAM size. So we can stream the subtree to the SRAM so that DRAM access becomes streaming. In addition, uh, uh, However, uh, prior work compromised the performance and used exhaustive search in the subtree search. Uh, this can avoid uh, uh, SRAM bank conflict, but it will introduce redundant computation. So after neighbor search is done, uh, feature computation will also introduce SRAM bank conflicts in feature gathering steps. Here we show an example of gathering six point features in a two bank two four SRAM. Um, each time we gather two point features into the feature matrix. In the first round of access, because P0 and P1 are in the different banks, so we get them in one cycle. In the second round of access, because P2 and P4, they are in the same bank, so we will have a bank conflict. And we can only get one feature in the first cycle and get another other one in the next cycle. In the third round of access, because P5 and P6 are in the different banks, so we get them in one cycle. And it's worth to mention that the labor information is dynamically computed. It is hard to optimize the data layout in SRAM in order to avoid bank conflict in this case. So to tackle those issues, we propose prison, a hardware algorithm co-design framework. In this framework, we propose two arithmetic optimization, work efficient labor search, and selective bank conflict division. Uh, accordingly, on the hardware side, we also designed two hardware units to accommodate these two optimizations. In work efficient neighbor search, we also split uh, KD tree into a top tree and several sub trees. Similar to prior work, we perform top tree search and uh, store the search result to a sub tree bucket. However, unlike prior work, uh, we perform normal KD tree search within the sub tree. Each time we load a sub tree and its corresponding bucket to the SRAM. And then we perform normal case research for all, uh, for all the queries within the subtree bucket. And we repeat this process for all the valid subtrees. And notice that uh, subtree zero doesn't have any query point, so we avoid loading on uh, use data to the expert. Well, it seems very trivial to have this optimization and because we use uh, case research to reduce the uh, redundant computation. And the, however, the live implementation will introduce uh, as one bank conflict. So let me explain this. So in this example, there are multiple requests perform tree traversal simultaneously, <coughs> and we we'll have a S1 bank conflict as we show here. Two requests simultaneously access tree nodes that are in the same bank. And our solution to such issue is to allow only one access to proceed and return none for the rest of the request. And for those non requests, we just let them ignore the nodes, leave the last node during the tree traversal. This is essentially an approximation of neighbor search. In feature computation, we'll also have to deal with band conflicts. But in, in this case, we cannot just randomly drop any conflict features because this um, network needs to enforce a certain feature dimension. So our solution is to return a replicate features, uh, return replicate fit features when we have bank conflicts. This resembles um, replication in point cloud network design. So here's the uh, example that we have shown earlier. We can get both P0 and P1 features uh, in, one, in one cycle because there's no bank conflicts. 
and in the second cycle, we'll have a fan conflict. And instead of storing one access, um, we return a duplicate PQ for the other access. By doing so, we can avoid fan conflicts. In the third round of access, um, there's no fan conflict, so we can get them in one cycle. Next, um, we are going to introduce our baseline hardware design. We use DRAM to store input point cloud weights and feature uh, neighbor features. On the uh, point cloud general accelerator, we follow the same hardware design as firewall uh, methodology. It has a sysopal array to accelerate feature computation and has a uh, neighbor search engine to accelerate uh, neighbor search operation. And we also reuse an aggregation unit from Maserati to accelerate feature gathering step in feature computation. So to support our two uh, selective band conflict elision scheme, uh, we only need to modify two parts in this case, uh, point buffer and labor feature, uh, uh, labor search buffer, because they store the point related data. And here's how we do it. So to support these two band conflict elision scheme, um, we augment the SRAM port with minimal hardware modification. Here we show the two band two port SRAM. Um, instead of directly return the, the conflict signal, we modify SRAM port as the highlight shows. And in this way, we can selectively mask the conflict signal based on all different modes in neighbor search and feature computation. However, simply applying this organization uh, will lead to a significant accuracy problem. <laughs> Here we show the accuracy comparison between the baseline and our method. As you can see, uh, the accuracy dropped quite a bit. The reason behind this accuracy drop is that uh, the network doesn't include the imprecise inexact neighbor information during the training. And this inexact neighbor information is actually happened during the inference. So in order to bridge the accuracy gap, we let the VM model to learn imprecise information during the training. Here's a network forward pass, and we include a generic band conflict model in this training process so that we can simulate the imprecise in uh, exact labor search during the training. The last thing about our coaching scheme is that the back propagation doesn't need to go through our band conflict model. So that even our band conflict model is non-differentiable, it's still used during the training. And as you can see, after retraining, our model can achieve the same accuracy as the baseline model. Here's the experimental setup. Uh, we eval evaluate three point call applications uh, and with three data sets. And in our evaluation, we evaluate uh, four point cloud DM models. And we also uh, will hope the uh, open source our code on GitHub. And here's the hardware simulation setup. Uh, we compare against uh, three hardware baselines, a mobile GPU, TGRAS plus uh, mobile GPU, and Maserati. And in our evaluation, we have uh, two variants. The first variant uses approximate labor search without bank conflict division. And the second variant uses both approximate labor search and bank conflict division. And here's our hardware implementation. There are some more details in the paper. And let's see the speed up. Uh, so um, here the x axis shows different networks and y axis shows speed up. And um, as you can see, our approximate labor search can achieve 1.7 <coughs> times speed up, and approximate labor search plus bank conflict division can achieve 1.9 times speed up. And as we can see here, the yeah. length point has higher speed up because the economy of higher labor search. And here's the energy saving. Uh, again, the x axis show the different networks, and y axis show the non-mass energy. Uh, approximate neighbor search can achieve 33% uh, of energy saving, and approximate neighbor search plus uh, band conflict elision can achieve 36% of energy saving. The main contribution from energy saving is from neighbor search because it reduces the DRAM traffic instead of the SRAM traffic. So in summary, nowadays point cloud has become an important modality in many computer tasks. However, memory irregularity in point cloud causes them a bit hardware unfriend. To time the memory irregularity, our key idea is to approximate operations in point cloud DNA using selective band conflict measure. However, uh, live implementation will 
introduce significant accuracy drop. So to regain accuracy, we incorporate memory access simulation model into the training loop so that the DM model can adapt any that delivers information during the inference. So that's the end of my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Oh, so um, I do have one question. So in, when you're talking about your approximation approach, right? You, if I read it correctly, uh, your approach basically if there's a conflict, you're, you return all and then you do search under that, end, right? right? So are, also, first of all, why did you take that approach? And also are there any other strategy that perhaps won't result in as much of the accuracy application. Right. So the the um, so the question is why do we just um, stop if there's any conflict right. with the tree traverse? Um, the answer is because there are some other strategies, for instance, we can return duplicate uh, points, for instance, and uh, that will resolve uh, for instance by infinite loop, or they will cause uh, the algorithm not going to work. So that that's uh, one one of the reasons we choose to just stop whenever there's a bad conflict in the tree traverse. I see. Um, and also in terms of the retraining to you know bridge the accuracy uh, gap, what kind of training costs are we talking about here? Um so the training cost is uh, the overhead is uh, one point five times compared to the normal training. Because, uh, and also we just write, write everything in uh, C because the bank uh, simulation. Um, however, if you just uh, optimize the code into uh, GPU, it could be even faster. Okay. So the uh, short answer is the, the, it has the overhead, but it's not significant. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, great. Just a quick follow up uh, on that training question. If I change the problem size, so on so forth, okay. would that matter? Um, <coughs> that's a good question. I we actually evaluate in a relatively small data set. It's not yeah, like the recommendation system, like a big, large data set. But I think um, the training. Uh, the simulation is proportional to the data size. So, and the inference is also proportional to the data, data size, roughly. So I think uh, it won't change the training overhead. So they can. Yeah, over, overhead is one part, but the other accuracy to correct the... Uh, right, I think the accuracy depend. Uh, so in our community, there's not, there are not many like large uh, point cloud data sets for those type of tasks. So it is work is a, a good direction to work to investigate. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Fong, and all of the presenters one more time. Okay, let's conclude this session. Thank you track of this 2020. I think the other one is still going on and then uh, the closing remark is right after that. So thank you for everyone coming and staying through the session and um, catch you guys later. <laughs>